Good afternoon. I'm Amy Poteet, Associate Professor of Political Science and Co-Director of the Lola Sustainability Research Center at Concordia University. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, Soft Climate by 2030, Building a Greener Montreal Together. Today's event is co-sponsored by four units at Concordia University, Fourth Space, the Department of Education, the Loyola College for Diversity and Sustainability, and the Loyola Sustainability Research Center. The Loyola Sustainability Research Center is a uh, research center in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences with membership drawn from across the university from all four um, faculties. Um, we are devoted to promoting transdisciplinary research, bridging the social and natural sciences, the humanities and engineering, art and design. I'd like to acknowledge that Concordia University is located in Chajoge, Montreal. Chajoge has historically been a gathering place from people of diverse origins. It today has a highly diverse population. That said, we acknowledge that the Ganyo Gehaga Nation are the historical custodians of the land and that this is unceded land. It has become a ritual to acknowledge the unceded nature of the land in Montreal and Djoge when we are um, beginning events. We oftentimes read that territorial acknowledgement or make the statement and simply move on without dwelling on it. I'd like to invite people to think about what it means to say that this university, that we are located on unceded land. Today's webinar is part of our regular seminar series on sustainability. It is also part of a special series of global dialogues to solve climate by 2030. We have two facilitators for today's event, Dr. Ayaz Nassim and Paul Lott. I'm going to briefly introduce them and then hand it over to them. So first, um, Dr. Ayaz Nassim is professor of education here at Concordia University. His research, which has been extensively funded by SHRC and other external agencies, reported in numerous articles and books, focuses on the relationship between social media and education and a set of themes that one might group together as elements of social sustainability. These include peace, radicalization, minority representation, and environmental sustainability. His books include Scientism and Education with Emory J. Heislop Margeson, Education, Gendered Citizenship in Pakistan, and Representation of Minorities in Textbooks, International Comparative Perspectives, which is co-edited with Adila Ashad Ayaz, who's also on our panel today, and Jesus Rodriguez Rodriguez. Our second facilitator for today is Paul Lott, who is currently completing his master's degree here at Concordia University in Educational Studies with a focus on environmental education. Paul spent nearly a decade traveling and teaching abroad in Australia, Vietnam, and Taiwan, and is now a kids running coach here in Montreal. Paul is an ultra endurance athlete and published writer who shares the stories of marginalized members of the running community in an effort to make the outdoors more inclusive and culturally diverse. With that, let me now hand things over to Ayaz, who will begin the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thanks uh, for the introduction. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll briefly introduce uh, and you know, say a few words about this webinar series. It's a part of a larger project which will run for the next five years. Doctors uh, Arshad Dayas and, uh, uh, and, and Peter Graham of LCDS and DOE are partnering with an initiative called Solve Climate by 2030.org, which is led by the Brad Center for Environmental Policy. By joining this global initiative, they're connecting Concordia University to about 100 universities in 50 different countries. So it has a very wide reach. This webinar um, is based on the Fairian idea of consciousness raising along with highlighting local solutions to environmental problems. And the series will create a repository of local environmental problems and solutions which can be looked up by students in, uh, in at least 50 different countries, if not more. At a later stage, there might be a possibility of having an inter-student uh, dialogue from different countries. Uh, this uh, series is also being supplemented by an initiative called Hashtag Make 
Make Climate a Class, where teachers from participating universities will dedicate at least one hour of their class time to discuss environmental issues and problems. I've been also I've also been asked to <clears throat> to introduce one of our speakers today, that is Dr. Adila Shabayaz, who is an associate professor of educational studies at the Department of Education, Concordia University. Uh, Dr. Arshadaya has got her PhD at McGill, and her work is located in the overall context of neoliberal globalization, uh, and she examines the intersections of the theology of international development, political economy, cultural pluralism, sustainability, citizenship, a sociology of technology, hate speech and counter extremism, and social, uh, social justice in conjunction with advancements in interactive technology. I must say that's quite a, quite a spread. In her previous life, she worked as an anthropologist and worked extensively with the United Nations and the related NGOs in the development sector. She's uh, published widely and she's been funded widely, which is, which is amazing. Uh, she is a fellow of Loyola College for Diversity and Sustainability in the Simone de Beauvoir uh, Institute at Concordia, and she's also a founding member of the Educational Innovation Lab at the Aga Khan uh, Global Center for Pluralism. I can go on, but I think I'll stop here, and Paul can introduce the other two speakers. Thank you. Our first speaker today will be uh, Peter Graham. He's a professor at Concordia University in Montreal, whose academic focus is grounded in sustainability. He holds a PhD from Queen's University in Ontario. And Peter's love of nature and quest for sustainability extends <coughs> literally to his front door. His front yard and naturalized garden, garden garnered considerable criticism from his neighbors, which drew him into a battle against city halls, unsustainable bylaws surrounding lawn care and maintenance. He ultimately won the fight, which changed the laws to allow for naturalized gardens in his community. So we are happy to welcome Peter today uh, to share his story with us. And also we have um, Anthony Garoufoulos Auger. Anthony is a Montreal-based climate emergency organizer and public affairs strategist. He works his work focuses on shifting the climate discourse from incrementalism to emergency mode action in Canada. He is a co-founder of Extinction Rebellion Quebec and an initiator for the Climate Aviation Coalition, a pan-Canada coalition focused on reducing air travel to tackle emissions from that sector. He also sits on the board of directors at Rapid Decarbonization Group. He is presently the Quebec liaison of the Climate Emergency Unit, a newly established Canadian organization fighting for a World War II scale economic and social mobilization to address the climate crisis at emergency speed. So we also welcome Anthony to our conversation today. Thank you, Anthony. Okay, we have a short introductory video uh, to situate this uh, webinar series. Welcome to the Solve Climate Global Dialogues. You're participating in one of 125 events held across the planet, including in almost all 50 US states, part of a global project called Solve Climate by 2030. My name is Evan Goodstein, and I'm an economist and director of the Graduate Programs in Sustainability at Bard College in New York, the lead organizer for Solve Climate. This last year has been difficult for everyone. As the world looks forward to recovery from COVID, we are focusing tonight on the most important question facing humanity. What can we do in this year in our regions to help solve climate change while supporting struggling communities that have faced widespread loss of life, economic disaster, and joblessness. Worldwide, from Australia to Kyrgyzstan, from Colombia to Malaysia, and from South Carolina to South Africa, Solve Climate audiences are hearing from local experts and young leaders about concrete steps that can really help nations solve climate change while creating much needed jobs and incomes for everybody. The year 2020 was one of the two hottest years in human history bringing with it massive forest and grassland fires, record-breaking storms and hurricanes, and relentless rising seas. Solving climate is the challenge which the human species must now face. There's hope for the future. Solutions have continued to advance. 
This year, China committed to building a carbon neutral economy while the US rejoined the Paris Agreement. Solar, wind, and battery prices continue to fall while major car companies have been rushing to electrify the global fleet. Worldwide, movements for Black Lives Matter and Me Too are leading in bringing much delayed and urgently needed justice to the world. Time is short. We have until 2030, 10 years to solve climate. We can get a lot done in this decade. We have the solutions, but only if we focus the world on climate solutions and justice, and then do the work we have to do in our own cities and regions. For students listening, you are the leaders. Without you, the future we envision will not come. I'm asking tonight for your help. We're gonna discover powerful ideas for climate solutions and climate justice, and how you can be a part of the solution. But this message must reach beyond those of us who are listening right now. Would you ask all your <laughs> teachers this week in every subject to make climate a class? The teacher can assign tonight's webinars homework for the students and then afterwards have a one class period discussion. And we mean every subject from art to engineering, psychology to business, dance to chemistry. Teachers don't need to be a climate expert to lead a discussion about climate change. The Solve Climate Project as easy to use teacher's guides in nearly every subject and in three languages to help teachers make climate relevant to their class. It only takes courage. Don't take no for an answer. Ask them, why not? This is your future. You'll be surprised how many teachers will say yes and thank you. Imagine you, thousands of leaders like you around the world asking their teachers once every school term to make climate a class. That means every term going forwards, hundreds of thousands, millions of students worldwide in their classes talking about climate solutions. COVID has shown how fragile our global economy and society are to extreme events. It's also shown that vulnerable people are facing the hardest, most damaging impacts. This is also true with climate change. Science has made it clear that unchecked, Global warming will mean an unending onslaught of extreme events, causing untold suffering for humanity and all creatures, species driven to extinction, a planet of environmental refugees. And yet, in many ways, this is the most exciting time to ever be alive as a human. We have the tools and networks and technologies to rewire the world with clean energy, reimagine the global food system, reinvent transportation and regenerate forests and grasslands and be well on our way to solving climate by 2030. Tonight, we will learn how to do this in our own cities, our own towns, our own regions. Thank you for the work you will do to promote climate solutions and a just world. So if we think about how to solve the climate emergency, it only makes sense to first ask the question, what exactly has caused that emergency? How did we get ourselves into this situation in the first place? Anthropogenic climate change means by definition that it's caused by humans, but what causes humans to change the climate? Why would we do something so crazy? Well, there is a fairly broad consensus that the climate emergency is a consequence of the global economic system. That is the way we, all of us together as, an entire, as the entirety of humanity, organize our ways of making a living, our patterns of livelihood. Of course, we are not all equally responsible historically, either for the economic system or for the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that are now changing the climate. So if the way we typically make our living here in Montreal is causing climate change, the next logical question becomes, where do those patterns of finding jobs and paying bills and buying stuff come from? And how can we change those patterns to not cause the climate to change? Where the patterns come from is the more important part of these two questions, because the patterns are almost impossible to change if we don't first understand where they come from. We will come back to the to the to the to how we change the patterns and solve the climate emergency in a minute. But first, the answer to the question of where the patterns come from is for the most part, we inherit them. We inherit the patterns in three parts. It is those three parts of our inheritance that keep the global economic system going the way it does 
even when we know our economy is driving the global climate, driving global climate change and a lot of other very serious problems on top of climate change. The first part of the pattern is already etched into the material world in the form of things like money and banks, factories, supermarkets, cars and planes, highways, office buildings, or even the homes we live in. Some of these material things keeping the global economy on its tracks to create climate change are the things we physically make like a refrigerator or a toy truck or a real truck or a book or a home, the stuff we make in our economic system. But some of the other parts of the global economy we make only with our minds. Buddhists say with our thoughts, we make the world, but it is important not to forget that with the world, we make our thoughts too. If you think of a forest or oil in the ground or fish in the ocean, you might notice that just by thinking of those things, by using the language, metaphors, frames, and other cognitive tools we've inherited, we change those things. We change those things with our inheritance because they become resources instead of something else. They were not always resources. People used to inherit the things we now take for resources as their relatives, for example, or as a symbol of a reciprocal social obligation. I give this thing and expect you may one day return the favor or some other meeting. Today, we inherit things, almost anything you can think of, as an economic thing on standby just waiting to become something else, like a tree to become paper to write on or, or oil in the ground to become gasoline in your, in your car tank or a fish in the ocean to become dinner on your plate. So the first part of the pattern is the world we perceive, think and feel about, but also the world that becomes part of our own cognitive practices as an economic world. The next part of the pattern is in the ways in which we put those material things into practice, our daily routine behaviors. We are all using our screen technologies right now to communicate. I'm speaking to you through a microphone, a speaker, and a screen, and we have all learned how to use those things. And we've also learned what are the right things to do and what are the wrong things to do. We learn how to find a job and how to do that job. We don't invent those behaviors or practices from scratch. We inherit them. We learn how to act in the world by watching other people, the people who were already in the world when we arrived. We see how they act in the world in particular ways and we copy them because we all wanna fit in with the people around us. The second part of the pattern is the habits and routine behaviors we inherit, our actions. The last part of the pattern of the global economic system we inherit is the ideas and the various other cultural and cognitive tools we use to make sense of both things in the world and our behavior that puts those things into the practice of the global economy. Those ideas come in the forms of words, metaphors, languages, theoretical frameworks, economic models, stories, myths, and other tools, uh, but also as learned ways of feeling and perceiving our aesthetics and emotions. Part of what we inherit from our moms and dads and caregivers and teachers is knowing how to perceive the world and how to feel about the world in any particular situation. This happens as part of the normal process of growing up from a baby to an adult. We are constantly attuning ourselves to the world and our dynamic brains are constantly being updated just by engaging with the world. The last part of the pattern we inherit then is the cultural code we use to fit into our society and to be able to recognize ourselves as members of our social group. So we have first the things in the world and the entire world that we inherit as particular things in a particular world. Next, we have the ways of acting in the world that seem normal to us only because other people who were already in the world when we got here were already acting that way. Finally, we have a bunch of tools we also inherited like language, ideas, stories, laws, social norms, values, and so on, that we use to keep our social world going in the same pattern. So if we want to solve global climate change, we have to basically stop inheriting that pattern that has gotten us into this mess of climate change. We have to refuse that inheritance. Now that might sound pretty easy, but actually it's very, very hard to do. 
That's because the same tools we use to keep the world working in the same pattern are the same tools we use to tell us who we are. We use those tools to answer questions like, who am I? What is a forest? What is a person? What is a fish or a refrigerator or even our planet? We do need to change those tools though. Otherwise the same pattern that brought us into the climate emergency will keep bringing us into other emergencies like the biodiversity emergency or the pollution emergency or the pandemic emergency. The history of putting our tools into practice is not a pretty picture. Even though those same tools give us lots of alibis to make us forget about how badly they are really working. Today, I wanna to focus on changing just one tool, the tool we use to transform the world into a bundle of resources. That tool is a keystone tool. A keystone is a stone in a building that holds up the other stones. A keystone species like a wolf or a sea otter keeps the whole ecosystem in place. If you remove it, the previous system will collapse and transform into something else. That can be a good thing or it can be a bad thing. Sometimes we introduce a species into an ecosystem without fully understanding what kind of impact it will have. Scientists put Pacific salmon in the Great Lakes, for example. The salmon ate all the small fish in the lakes, so there was nothing left for the big fish to eat anymore. If we could take those Pacific salmon out of the Great Lakes and leave more room for the brook trout and lake trout and landlocked salmon who were there since shortly after the last ice age, the whole system would be a healthier system. All the fish in the lakes would be happier and healthier. Montreal makes me a particular kind of person. Montreal has always been kind to me. The people are good and welcoming people. We have four great universities here. We have a great river. We are close to forests and mountains. We're close to Ottawa and Quebec City, hundreds of restaurants, museums. I can in many ways become my best self only because Montreal has been a great parent to me, a great mentor and a great friend. And yet Montreal could be an even better parent if she were not being constantly driven insane by some people who mistake Montreal for a resource. Montreal is home to the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity, but right now some of the last natural green, space, green spaces and last intact ecosystems rich in biodiversity are being destroyed on and around the island of Montreal. People sitting high up in office buildings in Montreal are taking decision, decisions today that will have dire consequences here or somewhere else. Decisions about mining projects or forestry projects or about energy projects or decisions to make and sell harmful products. And they will be taking those decisions by using the cognitive tool of the world as a bucket of resources. When we drive the people and things who make us who we are insane, it generally does not turn out very well. It does not help us, it hurts us, especially in the long run. If there is one first important step that we all need to take to solve the climate emergency, I think that first step must be to begin to think of the world as our parent, as our mentor and our friend, and not as our slave or our enemy, not as a potential profit on a balance sheet. We need to understand that we can never become our best selves when we are in a war, and especially when we are in a war with that which ultimately determines who we can become. To solve the climate emergency, we need to rethink our collective inheritance to become our best selves and our best world. Thank you. So hello, everybody. I think Peter kind of nailed it. And my talk is uh, in some ways a continuation of what Peter said. And not a surprise, we collaborate and we write together on this important issue. We teach together on this thing. So given that I have only a short time, I will highlight three important points related to the environmental problems. First, I'll highlight the need to understand the root causes of global environmental problems, uh, especially the limits of our knowledge to solve environmental issues and the need to expand our knowledge base. Uh, second, I'll cautious, and that's uh, because we are doing this activity around the globe, I'll caution focusing too much on local solutions at the cost of ignoring global social and environmental justice. 
The first two part of my talks address the limits of our knowledge and the solutions we seek within the dominant knowledge framework. Finally, I will take a few examples of flawed knowledge solutions that enhance the problem rather than solving them. Since we are in Montreal, I will mention some of the behavior patterns observed by experts within the context of Quebec. And as Peter mentioned, Quebec is a beautiful place and we have a special relationship with land. Um, but however, uh, experts have mentioned some behavior, observed some behavior patterns. And uh, while I mentioned those, this does not mean Montrealers or Quebecers or Canadians are doing something wrong. It just shows how the knowledge base, which forms the foundation of our worldviews, needs to change and expand. Otherwise, the change required in our behaviors and organizational structures for our survival will never take root and societies around the globe will be stuck in the rhetoric of change or talking the talk, but will never be able to walk the talk. So today, the global society's most significant challenge is changing worldviews and behaviors towards how we interact with each other and our environment. I think Peter just mentioned like, you know, uh, we inherit these things and we continue doing these things. From economic disparities to environmental degradation, everything indicates that human beings need to change their behaviors and organizational structures for our survival. Considering the fact that contemporary environmental movements started in early 1900s, the question that begs to be asked is, why has environmental degradation continued despite repeated warning from scientists, despite developments in technology, despite persistent attempts by governments, businesses, policymakers to stop environmental degradation. Today, we have evidence-based clear-cut markers that define a failure on a global scale when it comes to saving the environment. For example, in 2018, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services reported that 75% of Earth land areas are degraded, which undermine the well being of 3.2 billion people, which is almost half the humanity. And if this trend continues, they have warned, 95% of Earth's land area would become degraded by 2050, leading, and this would Imagine the scale of this thing and what would it lead to? It would lead to forced migration of millions of people, food production systems would collapse, biodiversity would diminish. And I think it's not difficult for us to imagine all these things because this whole, this last one year of pandemic has taught, taught us like, you know, how this production system, the chain system breaks down and the kind of, uh, only today we were find, we have found out like some essential medicine is not available for to treat uh, COVID-19 patients in Canada. So perhaps it is time to question our very knowledge base from which we draw solutions to problems. And I think decolonial theory is a very helpful theory in showing us the limits of our knowledge. Gayatri Spiva talks about worlding of the West, meaning the whole world, West is imposed on the world as the world. So whirling of the West has led to the dominance of Western knowledge system. Decolonial theorists such as D'Souza Santos illustrate Western knowledge has been engaged in epistemicide and killing of other knowledge systems. While the worlding of the West and epistemicide helped the West to colonize the rest of the world, it greatly damaged its knowledge base by making it very narrow. It was one thing to impose Western ideals of development on colonized people's minds. However, such imposition does not work well with non-human life forms, just as Peter gave the example of the fish. And as a result, what we see is a loss of species necessary for a well-balanced ecosystem. It is ironic that the knowledge system and ideals of development that were put in place to justify colonization and oppression of peoples around the world are now proving to be insufficient, shallow, and too narrow to address dynamic, multi-layered, intersectional, and very complicated problems related to environmental degradation. Perhaps the world would have been a better place if epistemologies or the knowledge systems of most of the peoples of the world were not deliberately excluded or silenced, and if the knowledge systems of the other 
were not relegated to traditions or superstitions, witchcraft, and folklore. The system side of indigenous and other knowledge systems has led to a very narrow, myopic, unimaginative outlook, which has been and continues to be considered synonymous with progress. There is no denying that the dominant knowledge systems and the resultant practices are focused on profit generation. The world subscribed to development paradigm that seeks constant expansion and consumption. Talking about sustainability or preservation within this paradigm makes no sense. All claims to greatness and indicators of advancement for the dominant Western countries are based on indicators that put a strain on the environment. With the improvements in technology and shrinking of time and space and communication technologies become making it easier for different countries to communicate a single narrative, a uniform dream of living similar to Western standards has been universalized. We are looking at, at if we are looking to tackle this issue of global warming and environmental destruction at all, we need to look for different knowledge base, a knowledge base that could formulate worldviews and behavior patterns very different than those we are familiar with. So we, when we are thinking about solving environmental problems, we need to ask what kind of toolkit do we need to stop environmental degradation? The toolkit we currently have was given to us by the master, if I have to quote Audrey Lord here. It is the very knowledge base that is the root of the problem. We will never be able to dismantle the master's house with the master's toolkit. We need to seek knowledge that challenges our ways of thinking. Now, this connects to the third important point I would like to bring to your attention today. We need to discard excessive nationalism and focus on active critical global citizenship, which stands on the foundation of social justice if we are to solve environmental crisis in the next 30 years. And I quote Andrew Dobson here, when Dobson says that social justice at the very least is a necessary condition for environmental sustainability and the other way around. I believe that citizens not only need to take charge of their local environments, but simultaneously need to enhance their knowledge of global injustices. This is very important. Why is there a need to pay special attention to global injustices when we are looking to stop environmental degradation? Let me take a few examples of local solutions that do not pay much attention to the global social justice issue and ultimately end up exacerbating problems instead of solving them. Let's have a look at electronic vehicles that are being proposed, you know, a possible future cutting back on carbon footprint. According to one estimate, by 2030, there would be 125 million electronic vehicles. And Quebec recently announced that all vehicles in the province would be electric by 2035. There are economic and social costs links to the, linked to the production of batteries for electronic vehicles. Serious environmental concerns have been raised regarding the production and the recycling of these batteries. That is, if we ever get to the recycling stage, because currently there's no viable mechanism for recycling both iron, lithium, and nickel metal hydrate batteries. Over the past decade, growing demand for electronic vehicles has led to a tenfold increase in lithium ion battery production. The first generation electronic vehicles are currently beginning to end, to, to reach the end of their lifespan, which means millions of batteries would soon be ready to be dumped in landfills, presumably in developing countries. Some NGOs have raised concerns that multi million metric ton heap of used batteries would end up in trash. Now production, consumption, and recycling of these batteries is not as simple as it's being advocated by the industry. Of course, in this short talk, I cannot cover all aspects, but let me briefly try and explain how electronic vehicles as a solution leads to environmental and social justice problem globally. The batteries needed for electronic vehicles rely on rare minerals, and we'll just talk about cobalt and lithium, there are others as well. So nearly 50% of world's cobalt reserves are in Democratic Republic of Congo. Its extraction is tied to armed conflict, 
illegal mining, human right abuse, and harmful environmental practices. Another 20% of cobalt comes from artisanal mines of Central Africa, where 40,000 children are made to work in extremely dangerous conditions. And this fact has been um, recognized by UNICEF. The dust from excavation contains toxic materials, including uranium, which causes a number of health problems and birth defects. Cobalt mines, they contain sulfur minerals that generate sulfuric acid. Said. When this thing, when they are processed and they are exposed to air and water, this process is called acid mine drainage, and it drains inside the earth. It devastates rivers, streams, aquatic life for next hundreds of years to come. More than half of the, if you look at lithium, it's the same story. More than half of the lithium in the world is found in the driest regions of Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile. Lithium mining requires a huge amount of water. According to some estimates, almost 2 million liters of water are needed to produce just one ton of lithium. The mining of lithium consumes 65% of the water in these areas, which causes, of course, groundwater depletion, soil contamination, and other forms of environmental degradation. Additionally, toxic chemicals needed to, proceed, uh, to process lithium, they leak into the ground, spread in the air, destroying the ecosystem and food production. This forces local communities to abandon their lands and migrate. Now we have sufficient evidence that extraction of lithium has caused water-related conflicts within communities in these regions. Now, if we look at this particular proposed solution, we can also see, uh, make some other observations. For example, electronic cars will not solve the traffic congestion or parking related issues in our already overly built neighborhoods, yet they are being proposed as sustainable solutions. Furthermore, there are additional injustices and environmental destruction when we start talking about recycling of these batteries, which we, are, we have started talking now, and I know there are plants that are being put in place, but currently less than 5% of these batteries are being recycled. So recycling of these batteries is not only it's very costly, but it's also very energy intensive. So if you're saving energy in the beginning part, you are, you are saving that, you're spending that energy towards the end of their life cycle. It's energy and intensive, and it can lead to harmful emissions generated by the smelting process. Despite high cost, recycling plants do not recover all valuable battery materials. Additionally, as is in the making stage, batteries can leak dangerous materials, cobalt, nickel, manganese, contaminating, contaminating soil and groundwater, threatening ecosystems, and of course, human health during the recycling. Now, to complicate matters even further, there's a large fluctuation in the prices of these raw materials. This means that recycling might not be viable in the end to begin with. Another issue that complicates it further because we, we, our technologies improve every day, we might see a different type of battery, which would make these very expensive, energy-intensive recycling plants redundant in coming years. Now, Laura Marchand at CBC Montreal asks a question and I'll quote her. She asks, are Quebecers hypocrites when it comes to climate change? End of quote. She puts forward another question. She says, and I quote her again, they talk the talk, but do Quebecers walk when it comes to going green? Her investigation reveals that although the that environment is an important issue that matters to Quebecers and Quebec sees itself as having a very strong relationship to the land. When it comes to behaviors, that's not quite how we behave. Professor Pierre Olivier Pigneau, uh, the chair of energy sector management at HEC Montreal mentions the fact that while Quebec is the province with lowest per capita uh, emissions, it is largely due to the fact that provinces electricity is produced uh, without fossil fuels and not because Quebecers are inherently more environmentally friendly. According to the prof, Quebecers behave like any other North American. In 2008-18 study, he found that Quebec SUV and truck sales have climbed 246% since 1990. And we know if everybody on this earth wants to live 
according to the North American standards, we need five to eight more planets to, uh, to just you know, exist. Similarly, Conference Board of Canada gave Quebec C grade when it comes to waste generation and a D minus on energy consumption. Now, this is despite the fact that there's a general agreement among Quebecers that climate change is an issue that needs to be addressed. Many people, including Laura Marchand, um, ask, why is that so? And she, again, I'm quoting her, she puts the question, is it hypocrisy or a misunderstanding about what is needed? Now, as a sociologist and a professor who interacts with young people within the university, I can attest it's not hypocrisy. Many Montrealers I interact with are extremely concerned about environmental issues. Therefore, I would like to argue it's not hypocrisy, but a narrow mono epistemic knowledge base that does not provide them with the tools they need to address the environmental issues. If we have to solve environment related issues, more needs to be done at the level of expanding our knowledge bases and including other knowledge systems that have been excluded from the dominant knowledge base. What we need is an ecology of knowledge systems to tackle ecological problems that we are facing today. I'm going to stop here and then uh, after Anthony speaks, we, I think we can take the questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Dila. We appreciate your insights. Um, I also want to remind our audience today that we do have a question and answer box. If you do have a question for any of our panelists or our speakers, feel free to type it in the box and we will answer it after our last speaker. Um, I'd like to open up the floor to Anthony. He will be our final speaker for this afternoon. So Anthony, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm pleased to be at a conference called Solve Climate by 2030, which highlights the need for rapid action to limit climate breakdown. I'm just going to be a little critical of the name. I don't actually think that we can solve the climate crisis by 2030, but I do think that we can limit the damage caused by climate change uh, significantly if we take actions from here to 2030. Uh, and that should be the objective is to limit the damage because we've already committed ourselves to quite a lot of damage. Uh, and I think that that's the best that we can do. And I'm going to add to uh, what Peter said about understanding, because I agree that we need to understand the problem before we can find solutions. So uh, what I want to add is just understanding the scale of change needed. And this is pretty clear in the, the scientific literature about how quickly we need to act uh, in order to limit the damage of climate change. So according to the latest estimates by climate scientists published in the Nature Journal late last year, there's already a one in six chance that we've already committed ourselves to 1.5 degrees of warming above the pre-industrial level. That doesn't seem like a lot, maybe for some of you that don't really understand the nuances of the temperature rises, but at that temperature rise, we're talking about most coral reefs bleaching out. Uh, and it's also considered a death sentence for low-lying nations and coastal cities because it locks in sea, sea level rise uh, that will basically wipe them out. Uh, according to the United Nations Environmental Program, current government pledges would commit us to three degrees of warming, above three degrees of warming. And uh, in, in Canada, in particular, there's, there has been studies, but if every country were to adopt the same reduction target, and that's what I mean by pledges, is how much we've committed to reduce emissions by in the future. But if every country adopted Canada's reduction targets, we'd also go above three degrees of warming, which is considered apocalyptic. It's that nothing good comes out of that. Uh, however, that's what governments have pledged to do. And what they're actually doing is a different story. And when we look at what current measures are in place, or we look at the, the trend of business as usual, we're currently on course for about four or five degrees of warming. So here we're talking about apocalyptic crop failures. We're talking about mass starvation. And there's already leading scientists kind of ringing the alarm bell that this could mean billions of people dying. Uh, and I mean, the radical organization, the World Bank has even said that at four degrees of warming, uh, we're lit basically, it's beyond our capacity to adapt. Uh, and it would be a disastrous situation for humanity. Um, so uh, emissions, unfortunately, emissions continue to grow, as you likely know, except for last year where emissions decreased by about 7% according to the global carbon budget. And interestingly, to, in order to limit uh, temperature rise below two degrees C, which is what governments agreed to do uh, at the Paris Agreement, as well as pursue efforts to try to limit it to 1.5, but that actually would require emissions to go down globally by about 7% a year. And that's 7% a year starting now, 
and continuing till we reach about seven, uh, about we, until we reach zero emissions. Uh, so that gives you kind of an idea of the scale of the global challenge, 7% a year. That's what emissions were, went down by last year when we had all of these measures in place to limit COVID. And that's the global average. So Canada is a wealthy country and one who's historically emitted more emissions than the global average. Uh, has an obligation under the international accords that has signed on to to do more uh, to than the global average. Uh, so we're talking here about double digit reductions every year per year starting now if we want to keep temperatures below two degrees. Uh, so that's the scale of the challenge. Really, it's nothing short of radical and immediate cuts in greenhouse gas emissions will give us a chance of avoiding irreversible, because there are tipping points, and I suggest people read and try to understand uh, a bit of the climate science around these tipping points, but potentially irreversible cataclysmic climate breakdown. So what is to be done, and what is to be done locally, if, uh, and what kind of solutions can we put in locally uh, at the, yeah, I guess municipal and regional level uh, to try to address this, this gargantuan problem? So I think, yeah, it is important first to, for all governments act and a municipal and, and I also agree that you know municipalities have an important role to play in reducing emissions. But I want to highlight that without federal government management and an all-out government approach, uh, we're very likely not going to be able to reduce emissions at the scale that's called for by the science. And what's likely needed is something in the order of what the government has done during World War II on the home front when it mobilized the entire society and the entire economy in the face uh, of the war. And at that point, there were massive changes in all of society in terms of dietary change, uh, the types of jobs that were created uh, that are, provide interesting lessons for how we could address climate change right now. Uh, but I'm gonna focus on what we could push municipalities to do in the rest of the time that I have. Uh, but I think what's a, one of the approaches I want to take is I think municipalities have been you know, signing on to these declarations for climate, the same that they declared a climate emergency. They've been putting out climate plans, you know, with some nice language, but there are inconsistencies. And I think that part of a strategy to kind of open people's minds about what's needed for this large scale transformation is to really call out municipal governments on these on these inconsistencies to show that we're not really taking the climate science that seriously. Uh, and here I'm gonna focus on some of the lesser known, uh, lesser known issues and some of the biggest sources of CO2s that we're not talking about, and that's aviation and food. And I'm focusing a bit on this because it's a bit of the, that's part of my area of focus in the work that I do. Uh, so we need to limit air travel. Air travel, even though it went down during COVID by about 66% in 2000, has continuously continued to grow uh, over the past decades and represents about 2% of global CO2 emissions. However, when you consider non-greenhouse gas warming effects, like the clouds that are produced at, at, at the, the exhaust of the, the planes, it actually represents about 5% of the global warming effect. Uh, so to put that in perspective, if aviation was a country, it would rank about seventh, uh, it would rank about the seventh larger emitter, emitter of greenhouse gas emissions producing about the amount that the entire economy of Germany produces. So had we actually respected the binding agreement on the first binding international binding agreement on climate change, uh, the Kyoto Protocol, emissions in, from aviation would have gone down by over 20% below 1990 levels. And that interestingly would about be the amount of, there would be about the same amount of planes that we currently have right now with COVID had we respected the Kyoto Protocol. And the reason is because we actually have to reduce the number of planes to address aviation. And while there's a lot of greenwashing out there about aviation being able to be green, right now, even if, even if the aviation industry adopted all of the best technological innovations for, for increasing fuel efficiency and decreasing the emissions intensity of aviation of planes, uh, emissions would continue to grow over the next decades because we continue to put more planes in the sky. So since 1990, we've actually doubled the amount of planes and the emissions have actually more than, more than doubled uh, over that period. So about every 30 years, we double the amount of planes and it comes with a corresponding doubling of emissions. So this is a huge problem and one that we're not talking about. And there's also an injustice here because it's estimated that only 
about 10% of the global population has ever flown. And this is this global 10%, which is mostly in rich countries and affluent individuals. Uh, yeah, they're a very small portion of the population responsible for quite a lot of warming. So this 90% of the rest of the world is not responsible uh, for this warming and is suffering the consequences. So what can be done at the municipal level? Uh, so we need to call for radically reducing and rapidly reducing the number of flights. Uh, so Montreal, there's a couple of things I can do. One is to has to say the truth about the industry's impact on climate change. It has not acknowledged, but neither has the federal government and probably most governments in Canada acknowledge the significant role that aviation plays in warming the planet. And this is probably out of fear and cowardice, but this needs to be called out and they need to show leadership and actually talk about this problem. Uh, and that's the first step. And then once you acknowledge that the problem is there, then we need to address it. Uh, and one of the things that Montreal could do, but this can be also done in other cities, is put a moratorium on new airport expansions, as well as new airports. So Montreal Trudeau Airport over here in Montreal is undergoing an expansion, or at least it's a proposed expansion. And we need to say that this is not acceptable. Uh, and cities need to, be, to begin developing economic plans to reduce our dependency on international tourism. And in the case of Montreal, which is an aeronautic hub, to come up with solutions uh, to address the needs of workers who will be impacted uh, by this shift. Uh, and if you're more interested in this issue, then I recommend checking out the, the work of the Stay Grounded Network, which is an international worker groups that work on this issue. And we need to also address diets. I won't spend too much time on this. Uh, but animal agriculture is responsible for 14.5% of global greenhouse gas, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it's also a leading cause of deforestation. So there's a growing international consensus that to address this, we need dietary shifts. However, the memo hasn't seen to be received by governments in Canada and the federal government is still in denial about it. It's not talking about it. The city of Montreal does not have a plan to address this, it barely speaks out. The new climate plan, barely, climate plan barely addresses, there's maybe one word about reducing the impact of food, barely addresses the issue of animal agriculture and this needs to be addressed. Uh, and one of the things that the city of Montreal can do is it could sign on to the Good, Good Food Cities Declaration, which helps them commit to helping the shift in dietary trends towards more plant-based diets. City of Toronto signed on to it. The city of Montreal can do the same. It commits cities like Toronto to reduce, to help reduce meat consumption by 80% by 2030. Uh, so that needs to be done. And again, the cities and all levels of government need to speak the truth and tell the truth about this, about this important issue. Uh, and like Peter said, we need to stop inheriting patterns. Uh, and in the case, in this case, we're talking about unsustainable food patterns. So one way this can be done is to have, an easy way to actually this can be done is to have a national sustainable school lunch program. Canada is one of the few countries in the Western world that doesn't have a national school lunch program. There's talks about it being done, but why not have plant-based foods in schools across the country and even update the curriculum to have kids talking about the sustainability and the environmental impact of their food and about ecological forms of uh, farming. That's one easy thing that can be done so that young, young, the younger generation inherit new patterns that are better for the environment. And I don't know if I'm over time, um, but I'll just end with this. Uh, and what I would think, you know, so these are important solutions, but I think probably the most important thing that people could do uh, is uh, get involved, get involved in the climate movement. There's a vibrant climate movement. If you're in Montreal, uh, you know, we have one of the largest demonstrations in the world uh, when there was the climate strikes. Uh, and it's not going away and they're calling for radical media cuts and greenhouse gas emissions. And they're also calling for an ecological reform of our education system. So really not just one hour a, a semester, but the, the entire curriculum taken into account sustainability. So we're talking about complete reform. And this is being called for by a large coalition of students. So I really encourage people to get involved in their local groups. If you're an adult, maybe get involved in direct action groups and civil disobedient groups like Extinction Rebellion which are really at the forefront of pushing for radical and steep cuts in emissions in a World War II scale economic and social mobilization. Uh, and I guess what I will end with is really, it's important that we don't take no as an answer, that we don't compromise, 
and that we push for what the climate says is necessary. The reason why we're not talking about aviation and we're not talking about food is because of fear. We're afraid of criticism. We're afraid of the political backlash that'll come. Uh, we need to overcome this fear and we need to speak the truth. And that's the only way that people are actually gonna be informed, but it's also about the problem and do something about it. But also it's, there's no point saying anything less than what is science, what the science is saying is necessary because it only pushes, it, it's only, we're only losing time and we're just guaranteeing that, that we're guaranteeing ourselves uh, failure if we do so. And I'll end it on that. Thank you very much, Anthony. That was a very informative and quite a sobering presentation. I appreciate that. Uh, we've had a few questions filter in um, in regards to the presentations. Um, if now is a good time, um, I'll go ahead and address one of the questions. Um, first, we have from James Grant. Uh, he's asked the question, why have we been relatively successful at solving the COVID pandemic and yet unsuccessful at solving climate change? Both are global in nature and require co cooperation. Now, if it's all right with the panel, I'd actually like to take this question because this relates directly to the research that I'm doing uh, in my grad studies. One of the things that I have realized through research is that we don't have or we're not fostering a capacity to care about each other. We talk a lot about the statistics, the facts, and honestly, these facts are scary. And most of the time when we're presented with things that are terrifying, we run in the other direction. It's a natural reaction to fear. So one of the things that I've been trying to understand is, you're right, why is COVID being taken care of, but not climate change. Well, just the other day in one of our classes, uh, one, of our, one of my colleagues um, told us that she lost her sister two days ago and that the majority of her family has been heavily affected by COVID. Now, what this is doing is, is, is this is hitting us at home. COVID is hitting all of us right where it hurts. And these global issues in, the Western, in our Western society, we don't see a lot of these issues. They're, pretty much invisible. They're relegated to communities that we don't see. So we don't have a capacity to care because we, we can't empathize, we can't relate to what's happening. COVID is right here on our doorstep. It means so much to us because our families, our friends are dying right now, today. So in a way of how can we get people to care? I think that maybe there's a way to Take away the facts and replace it with kind of uh, emotional intelligence, ways to foster care amongst both children in our schools, also amongst adult education. Um, and as Dr. Adila pointed out, giving voice to the, these communities that are most affected by climate change is a vital component to solving this issue. If it's not knocking on our door, why do we care? So giving voice to these people is an excellent way to, to bring it home and put it right to right where it matters the most. And that's, that's right here on our, on our street and in our city. And uh, Do Dr. Adila, you also have a, a comment. Go ahead. Yeah, just a, just a quick comment. I think um, James nailed it. He said relatively successful. And I think, yeah, relatively is the you know, key word here. Because yeah, we, we see there are some nations that have dealt with this issue like uh, better way than others. But again, looking at the COVAX, you know, we are, we, our vaccination program, which is not doing great, like we have hiccups in and there, but uh, the COVAX program is suffering. So again, like looking at local, perhaps relatively successful in terms of global social justice, I do not know many countries that promised that they would contribute to COVAX program where, because see this pandemic, and, and Anthony quite rightly pointed out to a very important issue is travel. Like everybody wants to travel, especially from you know those who are privileged and have disposable incomes. They people are just trying to go out, right? You know, oh, I didn't get to have my summer break this year. And but what happens when you go to that place and that place has not had there? So you come back and you reinfect. And that's what we are looking at. We are at the third or fourth wave right now, and it's not going away, it's mutating. So for once, I think this pandemic has taught us that if we keep focusing on local and ourselves and our nations, 
we would be in big time trouble. So that's one place that has told us that, you know, and we are still not doing that. We are still not doing that. We are not committed as much to the social justice issue that uh, this pandemic should make us think. So I will stop here. I have two other questions from Pierre Alexander that I really need to address, but yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, open it up to, to Peter and then to Anthony. Y'all go ahead. I think Anthony was ahead of me, actually. Oh, you can go ahead, Peter. Well, I just wanted to point out that we haven't really solved uh, pandemics. Um, you know, when the Europeans arrived in North America, we had resistance to, to all these diseases for a reason. The, the sort of Western way of acting and being in the world, becoming in the world uh, has a tendency to generate pandemics. And there's no reason to think that we won't be in the same situation. And if, it, you know, it may be a hundred years, but I suspect it won't be that long. Thank you. Yeah, on, the pan on the pandemic, I, I'm actually the opinion right now that I think from what we're seeing with the third wave, the number of cases in BC, uh, the new variant, the P1 variant, uh, and the yeah, growing number of cases across the country. We're not, we haven't really learned from the first and second waves about, the, and, it's, and it's actually just kind of shocking that we've actually allowed the situation to get to the point where it is when we had the information like as of late December that these variants were gonna become the dominant variants by the end of March, early April. And it was our, the writing was on the wall and what the government failed to do, in my opinion, is to put in place effective public information policy to communicate the urgency of having to limit the amount of contact. And it was very inconsistent messaging over the last few weeks, particularly in Quebec, about what you could do. And there's still very inconsistent messaging about what you need to do to limit the spread of these new variants, but also just to kind of really stress the emergency about how bad these new variants are. We're only starting in the next last couple of days to talk about it. Uh, so I think that the lesson, what, I, what we'll see how, how this third wave plays out, but we need better public information policy. The media has tried to, and I you know, did a somewhat commendable job in the last couple of weeks to stress the importance of these new variants. Uh, but most, a lot of people do not watch the news. They kind of tuned out. And the federal government should have had a public information policy to make sure that the information was getting to people and that not relying solely on the media to be the, the, to be the ones that are um, amplified our message. Uh, so I think that that's something with climate change that we need to learn from is we need a, con a way to consistently talk about the urgency of climate change to the public through public information policy mm -hmm. uh, and about the solutions as well. Great, thank you, Anthony. That was a wonderful answer. Um, we'll move on to what Pierre Cardinal has written. Uh, it's quite lengthy, so I'll, I'll read it. And then Dr. Deal, if you'd like to uh, give him an answer, that'd be awesome. Um, so what Pierre says is, if we look at the theme of the seminar, Making Montreal Green, what do we make of the Monsieur and Madame Tout Le Monde argument? What can they actually do? Uh, if we look at the Homme de Ch uh, Chevrier, sorry, my French is terrible case with the uh, Contracero Seaport on the South Shore. What can people actually do to prevent this species of fish from disappearing from the face of the earth? Pierre sees civil disobedience, but that doesn't bridge the existential gap between humans, human animals, and nature. It's not an actual long-term commitment. How do you even popularize the need to see ourselves as part of a messed up ecosystem? What else is there for everyday people? Send letters to City Hall? or middle fingers to elected officials. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And his, uh, if you can read his, the other comment, I'll, because they're both connected, so I will answer them both, yeah. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah. And he also points out that, not, a, not really a question, but he, uh, he says, also, I just don't think that hitting on people trying to do their part in doing something like getting electric cars is any kind of productive action, again, at, Education is a key problem. And when it comes to the environment, most folks out there are in fact uneducated and hitting on them won't get them educated. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I would like to mention 
Um, both comments are connected. Uh, what can people do? People can do a lot of things, but in the absence of actual uh, critical dialogues like this, uh, well, people can keep going and keep buying electric cars, thinking it's a solution where it, it may or may not be the solution. Currently, the way, because when the first generation is coming to an end, these batteries, then they started talking about recycling plants. And as we have, as research shows, it's not, but every Joe, like I have, I have two or three issues with Pierre here. So the first thing, like the crux of my talk is about expanding our knowledge base and, you know, including other knowledge systems. And as Freire would talk, you know, um, reading the world along the word is important. And one thing is it challenges like our, so it's called pedagogy of pain as well. And I can see the pain here. He thinks I'm hitting on people by asking them to think about these issues and it's not hitting. It's actually expanding the knowledge base. And the other thing is average person on the street, there's this misconception that this degree hanging on my wall makes me something more intelligent or something that's not correct. Average person on the street, I work with remote communities very intelligent, right? The only thing is, if those things are not being discussed, then they are not on our horizon. And the kind of society we live in, Peter has talked about, you know, our ideas and the systems that we inherit, and we become a part of that. So my basic, basic argument is to expand the knowledge base. And that's where the problem is arising, because you see that it's misconstrued as hitting. It's not hitting. It is expanding your knowledge base, but it's not easy if you go and you do your research and you say like, what percentage of batteries recycled, uh, recyclable, you would find Google hits 99%. Yes, theoretically what they are saying and they are telling you, oh, it's good, it's good. But that's theoretically, it is 99% recyclable under perfect conditions, but all those other conditions, they don't talk about that. So again, again and again, we have been duped by industry into selling things to us. And we like buying things. We are now addicted to buying things, consuming things. And I'll tell you, what can citizens do? We can have a dialogue. I'll give you one example of something which is absolutely, absolutely useless. And this comes from a person who can actually stand and look at the flower for the whole day. And I'm hopelessly romantic when it comes to, you know, environment and beauty nature has created. I cannot, for the sake of God, understand the whole thing about cut flowers, okay? There's virtual trade of water. We don't, what people don't understand is one rose to grow takes around eight to 13 liters of water, right? Again, it's a very developed word because, you know, it's, uh, but now it's, uh, it's tricky because now we see a north and south and a south and north. So we have privileged classes everywhere. So upcoming economies and, and they, they start imitating the Western ideals and the Western way of life. So I'll just to give you one example, by 2027, the cut flower market would reach $41.1 billion. Currently, during pandemic, US alone spent $7.9 billion on cut flowers. What are cut flowers? You go to the market, you buy a bunch of flowers and you throw them out five days later. You, and, and there are arguments that, you know, these are providing jobs. No, if you go and you look at their, you know, their, there's land water, groundwater depletion, there's all the chemicals that go, usually it's women who are employed, it's a, you know, so there's tons of things that we can do, but we have to, and this is pedagogy of pain. It might seem like we are being hit by something. It's not hitting. If we have to do these things, as Anthony said, like we cannot enough with all this thing when we talk about uh, we can't hurt people, we can't feel, we are in a crisis right now. And if we're going to address crisis, it's going to be a pedagogy of pain. It's going to hurt all of us. We are all implicated. Anybody want any one of us who has more than two pair of shoes is a consumer. And I tell you, I have more than, I mean, my weather tells me I have to have like a summer and a winter, but uh, all of us are in it. So it's not hitting, it's just like, yeah, it's gonna be painful.
Thank you for clarifying that, Dr. Vila. Uh, we have another question coming in from uh, Trevor Smith. Ready to go. Paul, there's uh, one in the comment uh, in the chat as well from uh, Adriana Lima Morales. Great. Um, it's right in the beginning. Adriana. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, how do how do you perceive the whole of Canadian companies in the extraction of resources international, like the case of Brazil and the mining industry? How should we hold these companies accountable for their actions? There were visit various mining dam collapses in Brazil recently, some of which were responsible by Canadian companies in the Brazilian soil. I'm asking this question because we must also recognize that companies in Canada can also pre be predatory, predatory towards the environment, even though it's not the Canadian territory. My name is Adriana and Adriana is writing us from Brazil. Great question, thank you. In Brazil, one activist is being killed like you know every few hours. And Adriana, you're 100% correct. It's not only like making a company, a Canadian company doesn't mean like, you know, that it cannot engage because it's a, a companies are about profit making. We should understand that. But how am I implicated? I think what we can do is students are doing that. I think our students took up this thing to de-invest from land grabs because what was happening is as professors, as teachers, I know a lot of my students, Paul here is a teacher. So we, we, we put a little bit of money aside for our retirement, right? And that money is taken into a bigger pool and then given to one bank and that bank give it, give it to another bank and that, and then ultimately it's invested somewhere. And then we found out that it was invested, being invested in something that amounts to land grabs in Brazil, right? And students were very active in, uh, you know, promoting this thing that we have to de-invest from there, that banks have to you know, get that money back. We cannot be a part of that. But just by being a part of this global economic system, and I don't know if any country is outside that global economic system, uh, we are all implicated one way or the other. And even in Brazil, you, you, you know, Adriana, the dis disparities there are amazing, like, you know. So again, uh, as citizens, we have to be very cautious. We have to see, we were told for a very long time, while you are brushing your teeth, shut the tap and you are doing good deed. Give up your meat and you are doing, but these things are okay. I'm not saying these are good, bad things. Yeah, we, we should all be very cautious of our consumption. But in the end, the consumption made by industries and corporations is something that needs to be, you know, um, now it's up to citizens to problematize that and ask to make changes there. So I'll stop here. Excellent, thank you. Um, we'll go to Peter and then to to uh, to Ayaz, uh, and then unfortunately we'll be out of time for today. But uh, we'll take it to Peter for his comments. Thanks, Peter. Uh, I just wanted to point out that I think if you did if you did a a proper analysis of any mining project, where you look at the costs not just to the from the perspective of the mining company, but from the perspective of society as a whole, because there's always, you know, the mining company comes in, they make the mine, they create a lot of pollution, uh, and then they walk away with their profit. They leave the community with the toxic waste to clean up. Um, the government has a lot of problems. I mean, you look across Canada, there are uh, toxic waste dumps scattered across the country that's, that somebody will eventually have to pay for to clean up. So uh, we need to, you know, make, do the full cost accounting when we consider a mining project to begin with. But, but for, it's, it's absolutely uh, true that for Canadian companies to go around the world, because we are kind of the Canada is, is like the big mining company in the, on the planet, unfortunately. Um, we need to rethink the, our ethical uh, responsibility in the world today. Excellent, thank you. Ayaz? I'll just be very brief since we are running out of time. I, th I think one thing that comes out of this is that uh, we should all, all start by acknowledging our own complicity 
and where we are. Each one of them, not only at the national level like Canada or the provincial or the city level, but each one of us is complicit in where we are with respect to the, to the environmental crisis. And I was just thinking that just as uh, Amy read out the, the territorial acknowledgement, if you could kind of come up with a, with a complicity acknowledgement and, 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 you know, especially in, on, in webinars and seminars uh, and such endeavors on environmental degradation, uh, we, could, we could start by saying that we are complicit in Brazil, in Congo, and wherever the, these companies are, because we are profiting from what they are doing, even if those profits are not getting to us directly, we are complicit in what these companies are doing. So maybe we could, the students could, and it's so good to see three of my students presenting so beautifully today. Uh, maybe I, I, I can ask them to start maybe a movement, a, a small movement uh, to push for such an acknowledgement of complicity before, uh, you know, to be read before uh, such endeavors. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you, Ayaz, thank you. All right, so today we are, we are out of time for today, but uh, we'd like to thank you all for joining us. Um, and as we move forward in, in solving these critical issues, I think it's important to remember that we need to keep this conversation going, that it shouldn't just be relegated to a single webinar, that this is a conversation we should be having with our family and our friends and our coworkers, because communication is a key element to being a human being. So as long as we keep this point, part of it alive, I think we stand a really good chance to working towards uh, solving our climate issues, hopefully by 2030. Um, but uh, again, thank you all for coming today. We really appreciate your, uh, your support and I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Thank you.